cogido los casquitos, podemos dar comienzo a esta mesa redonda en la que vamos a hablar de la relación que hay, eh, sobre todo de la difusión que se ha encargado de hacer Internet de la defensa de los derechos humanos. En la mesa tenemos a Olmo Galvez, de Democracia Real Ya, tenemos a Leila Nachahuati, de Periodismo Humano y también representante de ARCO, y a Miral Husaini, que viene desde Bahrein para estar con nosotros y que forma parte de la comunidad de Global Voices. Ellos nos van a estar hablando de lo que ha sido la Primavera Árabe, el movimiento de Acampada Sol y varias revoluciones que han tenido lugar previamente y que a lo mejor no han sido tan conocidas, pero sí que han tenido un gran impacto en lo que ha sucedido en los últimos meses. Os dejo con ellos y un placer. And um, well, just feel free, guys, to um, jump in anytime and ask whatever whatever questions you you just come up. In, just raise your hand, and we we can just do you know a more uh, conversational panel if uh, if that's good with you. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, mobilizations and uh, and the role the internet has played within this frame of decentralized communications for social change that we're all uh, witnessing, especially during the last uh, few months. And here's our, our, here my Twitter account and just Amira and Olmo, in case uh, you want to, to just mention something related to the panel. So here are our Twitter usernames. So I'd like to ask you a question just uh, to start. And uh, I'd like to ask if any of you guys knows uh, what happened in January 14, 2011. Can anyone tell me? What happened in January 14? Anyone? Uh -huh. uh, a little before that, un poco antes del tema de Egipto. Túnez, ¿qué pasó en Túnez? Ajá. Ajá. Okay. Okay. So this was like um, the first time an Arab government was uh, overthrown by its own people, mm -hmm. and this is quite historic because it's a change from within. Instead of foreign invasions, instead of foreign interventions, it's uh, uh, the people itself that's deciding to to overthrow the the government. So we have these, you know, historic pictures with uh, the people chanting "Game over, Ben Ali." Um, we have uh, game over Mubarak and well, I, I really like this joke I always use it so 
uh, Mubarak is asking Obama, can you tell me the meaning of game over? Because the, these, uh, these uh, rulers were not used to these kind of concepts, you know, that their governments can end. So it's pretty historic moments that we're living that have led to uh, what some people call a domino effect or tsunami effect, where, uh, where people broke the, the, the boundary of fear and uh, just reach out to each other to express their real needs in them and demands in a context where they don't feel uh, represented by their government. So this is something that we have, at a certain degree, uh, witnessed uh, its, uh, its effects in, uh, in Spain too, although the contexts are, are definitely very different. So it's basically we are witnessing human revolutions. It's um, sometimes uh, it's... Uh, it annoys uh, activists and, and citizens working in this context to, to hear these uh, mobilizations called Facebook revolution or Twitter revolution or YouTube revolution because they're actually human revolutions and, and it's people's lives that are uh, at risk and, and that are at stake in this context. So before we, we go into deeper stuff on how technology was used, I'd like to introduce you to, to like a, a symbol, an icon of uh, this human revolution that started in Tunisia and, and went uh, to, to the different countries uh, on, the, uh, on the region. So I would like Amira to, to introduce us. Who, who are these people? What, what does this picture say to you? Can you maybe explain a little bit? Um, the young man in the photograph is uh, Khalid Saeed. Like Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia, the young man who, who burned himself and then ignited this whole revolution in Tunisia, um, exactly one year ago, this young man from Alexandria, his name is Khalid Saeed, he's an Egyptian man, he was arrested and beaten up by police in, in Alexandria, and because of him, a whole movement started online. What they did was they, the Egyptian activists formed a Facebook group called We Are All Khalid Saeed. And it was from here that small protests started, and then they started calling for the revolution on the 25th of February. So just like Mohammed Bouazizi sparked the revolution in, in Tunisia, which saw uh, an Arab dictator being kicked out of his position and out of the country in 29 days, um, Khalid Saeed, uh, his Facebook page, the page that was set up for him, was what sparked the Egyptian revolution. And 18 days later, Mubarak left. But the irony is that this happened one year ago. Mubarak is gone. But the policemen who killed Khalid Saeed are still, they haven't been trialed yet. There, there has been, there, they are on trial, but there hasn't been a sentence against him. Even in the whole of the Egyptian revolution, 1,000 people have been killed, but not a single policeman has been sentenced yet. It's very interesting. My microphone. So the picture shows an Egyptian girl holding, and, uh, holding Khaled Said, holding Mubarak, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and uh, with, the, with the January 25 tag. I think it's a very, very symbolic picture. So maybe Olmo, you can explain to us what these uh, pictures uh, mean in the context of, uh, of the Spanish uh, movements we're, we're witnessing. Uh, well, you fall seeing images about the, the May 15th movement, the uh, Acampada Sol, all the camps around. And that's, that for me is, well, you can only see young people there, but I, I would like to see an idea, an idea that travels farther away from people and just connects us from different backgrounds, different parts of the globe, from uh, Tunisia to Iceland, going through Egypt and coming back to, to Seoul. And that's the idea that connects the people, not just the people together, but looking for a brighter future that can, uh, where we can all be part of it and we can all be part of the change. And social media has played a tremendous role of empowering the people to, to, to share the ideas, spread the ideas, and make the, the change real. That's, for me, that picture. So, Olmo, you mentioned um, 
uh, you know, something that points to, to global and local, right? Uh, the revolution, it's a term that has been used in different contexts and I'd like to, or we would like to change the, con the meaning of that word not as the, those violent revolutions, but more a social revolution. I'd like to consider myself a, a revolutionary or a revolutionist and promote this peaceful revolution. But that, and that has to, to be held in a context. And the context, it can be a global context, but the revolution starts within each one of us. We are part of the system. We are all part of this of this thing that we want to change. If we are not able to change ourselves and make us a little bit better, and that's the local context of the revolution, we won't be able to, to reach that goal, that global goal, that we all aim to have more freedom, more democracy, more rights. But without the global sphere where you can change, exchange ideas and exchange data and, and move with one click from Tunis to Egypt to Greece to Iceland, then it's a lot harder to learn. So we are all connected in the global sphere, but the revolution starts within ourselves, our family, our friends, our little groups, and then uh, sharing the ideas and moving them from one place to another until we can all reach it. So there's like a, this uh, context where uh, uh, things happening in Tunisia spread to, to countries uh, far away through, through the new channels and the new tools that we can all uh, access. So Amira was telling me an interesting uh, statement that I thought it was nice to include and in, um, how yeah. activists learn from each other, governments learn from each other too. What does this involve, Amira? Uh, when Tunisia happened for the first three weeks, the international media was away from the scene. So for three weeks, the Tunisians were struggling on their own, and they were documenting their struggle and updating it on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube. And that's how we were able to patch the story together and see what was happening. And that's how activists around the world learned how to do things. But the government, Egypt followed the same example. Egypt actually had a revolution which was started as a Facebook event with a Facebook date and a time. Mm -hmm. And people registered and said we're attending on Facebook. But activists played a role on the ground. They went on the 25th of January and they were knocking on people's doors and they were talking to people and taking them with them to public squares. What the governments did was when they saw Bin Ali toppled in 30 or 29 days, they did not stand still. They, they thought, how do we stop this wave from coming? So they decided we'll have a little bit of reforms here and there, and, and, but it did not work. At the end of the day, what we saw is the same scenario f exactly following each other. Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, Libya. Libya is a really bad example. Syria, Syria now. We have hundreds of people who have been killed. We have tanks. Which are, which are shooting at the people. So governments learned how to oppress, and people learned how to document their struggle and share it with the rest of the world, to say, this is a peaceful struggle, this is what we want. What the governments did was they sh shared resources on how to stop it, how to, how to stop this wave, be it by promising reforms that they will not deliver on because they had all those years to act on reform. And then the, the other language they all know and they all share is violence because once you kill a few people and make an example out of them, the rest of the people will be scared and will go back to their homes. But this did not happen because for the first time people are empowered and are not afraid and they have lost a lot. Like in Syria, it's a do or all the other countries, it's a do or die situation. You either go on the streets and do it or the government will hunt you down, each and every single one of you, and you'll all be either dead or in prison. Yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, in Europe, we have learned a lot from all the 
uh, in Tunisia, Egypt, but I'd say that we are a little bit more close to uh, Iceland, Portugal, Greece. The, the glo global crisis, uh, as I see it, has not come yet. It, but we haven't seen the crisis yet in Spain. It will come in the next years and it will be a lot tougher than we think. I'd say that the, this global brain we are in, we are starting to detect it. And those are examples. Plus, we have a new tool that is technology. Here it is, to communicate from one place to another. We have been in Europe more related to, to all other European countries where, I've, where we've learned situation, like in Stuttgart, uh, lots of activists working there to, to stop uh, a huge project that they have in Greece, the, the brutality of the F, uh, FMI, uh, Fondo Monetario Internacional, and uh, in Iceland, what they've done with the banks and the politicians, in Portugal, the crisis that is coming, and here in Spain, that we will start well, we, are, we think that we are feeling it, but we are not feeling it yet as intense as it will be. So we've been more connected in that Europe, but uh, the collaboration and the exchange of ideas can be absolutely global. And now lots of places in Latin America, they are also joining. So you both mentioned the, the, the concept of citizen empowerment through technology. And I'd like to bring your attention to, to the fact that uh, for this, the first time in countries uh, with uh, repressive regimes, like, such as is the case in Bahrain or in Syria or in Egypt, uh, it's citizens, it's populations writing their own history and sharing it with the world. Because uh, until a few years ago, there was only one reality in these countries. It was the reality that the governments portrayed. So there's uh, this hand-in-hand uh, -hand, uh, work between uh, communication and, uh, and the image of the country and, uh, and, the, and the rulers of the country. So there wasn't any other uh, narrative that really had any strength and that got anyone's attention until now. Now we have two parallel realities. We have, uh, we have the official communications, which uh, I wanted to share this picture of Syria, so Syria is in a, in a situation now where uh, more than 1,500 people have been killed because of uh, demonstrating and uh, demanding reforms, democratic reforms, uh, freedom of speech in the country that has been ruled uh, by, uh, by the Ba'ath for, for 40 years. So this is a picture uh, that has been uh, on a few, uh, during a few days at the main official news site, which is called Sana. So this is the proof that the government shows of, uh, of popular support to the government. So this is a huge flag of Syria uh, that uh, supporters of the regime are uh, carrying around the, the country, around the city, to show that they're all supporting uh, the government in Syria, Bashar al-Assad. Of course, if, you, if you've lived there, if you've known uh, anyone who lives there, you know that they send you an invitation and, and you cannot say no when they invite you to these kind of demonstrations. They take children from, from schools, from people from colleges. Uh, they go door by door and, uh, and gather a lot of people to portray this image of uh, popular support. So this is the image we used to have. This is the image we've had for decades uh, in most of the countries in, in the Middle East. But the thing now, and this is actually the, the, um, the motto of, uh, of the Syrian official uh, communications agency. It's called the reality of events. See? So they call themselves the agency that portrays the reality of events. But now we have another uh, filter to, to access the reality of events the, that we can access through the centralized communications that the internet provides. <laughs> People are saying the people want the end of the regime. So it's something that was uh, unthinkable only a few months ago to have uh, uh, something, some material, some content like this registered and, and shared uh, widely and, and, and watched by hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> So 
So I just wanted to share these uh, two polls with you to, to answer the question that we saw before, that what uh, part did social media really play in mobilizations? And, and uh, we're focusing uh, both in the Middle East, where, where uh, contexts are very difficult for uh, citizen communication, and we're very difficult to this point, and, um, and we can see how this applies to, to Europe too. So I think it's interesting that uh, the, uh, the, the use of social media worked at three levels. One level is to organize, to organize people. Like Amira said, door by door has always been a way to, to um, gather people, but now we can do door by door through much uh, faster uh, techniques using tools as Facebook, such as Facebook or Twitter to gather people. And it's interesting that I talked to, who did I talk to? Um, Ahmed Garbiya, an Egyptian activist. We were talking about how in Egypt uh, they, they, they set up a specific date for the, for the demonstration. <coughs> It's January 25. This is like the big tag for the demonstration in Egypt. So if people were talking to each other and they were like, should we go meet uh, to, to go to a bar tomorrow? No, tomorrow no, because we have a demonstration. We have a revolution to do. So it's unprecedented, I think, in history that people set up revolutions following a calendar, following a schedule. So, okay, next week it's Egypt's turn, and next week it's Syria's turn. So the revolutions are happening according to a preset schedule. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this, uh, Amira, how this works in Bahrain with the tags and, and different countries. Uh, I won't talk specifically about Bahrain, but no. I can tell you about the, the region as a whole. Um, there has been a calendar of events, and, and, and it was funny because until the day, you don't know whether it's happening or not. Like in Syria, it was March 15th. And then we were like asking Syrians, is it happening tomorrow? Is it happening tomorrow? And they were like, no, nothing is happening until it really happened. Libya was February 14, but on the 15th and the 16th, the protest started. So they started a day earlier. Bahrain was February 14, which was also a day when, when the protest started. So everybody was, was ready, like the protesters were ready and the police force was ready. Um, Saudi Arabia had a protest date, I don't remember the date, but only one person turned up on the square and on the public squares there were more tanks and policemen and, and army personnel than, and, and nobody dared go out on the street except for one man in Riyadh and he was arrested immediately. <laughs> so it's a, it's a... So I mean, I want to ask you, how, how did the... Um this decentralization help uh, the cause and help uh, get people together? Because you think sometimes of, uh, of demonstrations as something that has to be very well organized, prepared in advance. So how does this match the inherent chaos and decentralization of social media? Social media is an organic thing. Anybody with a phone with an internet or access to the internet can broadcast information. And this is empowering in itself, especially in, in our countries, in our part of the world, because all mainstream media is either owned by the government or controlled directly by the government. And in cases it's independent, it is self-censored. So there is only one narrative, as, as Leila mentioned, and that's the official government's statement. If you go through Egyptian television or Tunisian television or the Syrian television now or any of the official, like there is one story that those are people who are supported by foreign agendas, like that's the joke, like everybody has a foreign agenda, they're supported either by the West or by any other c country and that everything is perfect and there, those people have no reason to, to protest or demand for anything. Um, the internet threw those governments off in that for the first time you have witnesses recording and uploading and broadcasting things in real time. They were all witnesses to what was happening on the ground. And this is a reality you cannot change. You can brainwash five or ten or twenty people or thousands of people who, who don't buy the, you know, who still buy into the government, uh, uh, the government narrative. But at the end of the day, there are realities on the ground that have been documented, and those are the realities which you cannot 
take away from people. They've written their own history, and they did it in an unorganized way. Nobody, like, the good thing about the internet is that you don't need to know one another, but also it's not an internet uh, related thing. It's just the technology that has been used, just like with the European revolutions at the turn of the century before the last, when the printing press pr played a role. So it's just the technology that's there and that has been used because it's easier to assemble. It's easier to gather online without being arrested. It's easier to organize things. It's easier to spread ideas without having the sphere of, of, in most Arab countries, any gathering of, what, five people <laughs> is an illegal gathering. <laughs> so it's easy. you cannot have those laws online because it's out of the government's control. What the government has been doing for many, many years since the internet started becoming popular is they block pages, they censor material, and uh, they make sites very difficult to access. But what activists have been doing over the years is they've been pushing the boundary and pushing for more freedom of expression and more censorship. When Arab activists met online, the first issues they met on was on how to combat internet censorship, how to have a voice, how to make their voices heard, how to overcome this hurdle, how to express their ideas in a free environment. And this is the training they had. So for many years, the government actually, by oppressing people and, you know, muzzling them, they taught people how to organize, how to mobilize online, and how to get together on a common cause. So the, at the end of the day, like one of the main jokes on the Egyptian revolution is when, when Mubarak dies and he goes to wherever they go to after they die, and they ask him, uh, how did you die? And he says, by Facebook. Like, was it poison? Was it... So... So, and, and when it comes to decentralization and, mm -hmm. and the use of, when it comes to the use of, uh, of uh, these tools, I think we have witnessed the, the, the extreme of uh, internet decentralization for, for citizen use and, and for citizen sharing information with, uh, actually with the Spanish, um, well, yeah, we can go back to this later. But uh, I'd like to, to go through these uh, tags, uh, Olmo, because I think it's very interesting that in Spain we didn't have one tag for the mobilizations like they did in most uh, Arab countries. We had like a lot of different tags. It was almost impossible to follow for media, for politicians. If you were not in there, you didn't even uh, get an idea of, uh, of uh, how big things were getting because we moved from, maybe, yeah. Olmo, you can... Uh, well, we, we as human beings shape technology, but technology also shapes us. And uh, as, uh, if Syria and Bahrain sounds uh, very exotic and very far away, and when she talks about uh, how media is controlled by the government here in Spain, even if the situation is very different, we have a real problem with our media. We have a real problem with our TV, with our public TV, with newspapers. They are either very influenced by the, the governments or political parties, or they might be just broke. And many of them are broke and just resisting there from the subventions or the money that they can get. So the, that filter, we can break it through technology, through social media and empowering people to communicate. Uh, how, Elmo, in, can, you tell, can you tell us about the mobilization day of uh, 15 of May, how it was organized online? Uh, uh, for example, with the, with the Twitter, is, we didn't have uh, a single hashtag because of the way the Twitter algorithm works. We wanted to have mm -hmm. uh, the people that were talking about it, this May 15th demonstration, we already knew each other, but we wanted to spread it. So we went to blogs, we went to more people. And one of the ways to spread it was to have a trending topic. In order to have a trending topic, you need to have lots of retweets and you need to have a, a different uh, topic to be talked about in, in different days. So that's why we, well, people and all of us, as a, as a brain, somehow understood that 
we need to have different hashtags during the whole week in order to have trending topics. And we ended up with four or five uh, worldwide trending topics coming from Spain. And that's something that, that no one can control. It's everyone is involved in that, and some of them beep, and they become trending topic, and people start following them, and then it has a lot more, it's spread a lot faster, and some others are not. In order to, to arrive to a, at, at that schedule that she was talking about, it's not, it's not spontaneous. If you, if you haven't been working on it for uh, three months before May 15th, it might look like something spontaneous or even worse. It might look like, like someone with a dark hand moved everything and he was preparing everything with his friends and in a little door. That cannot be done here. You cannot, you cannot reach something in a little single room with four brains thinking. It, you cannot get a trending topic in Twitter with four guys tweeting a lot. That cannot be done or the, the global brain will erase it and put something on top of it. There is a lot of work and uh, in order to reach to this May 15th we have to, well, uh, Facebook, Twitter, blogs, uh, Lots of people in Spain, probably more than 5,000 people were working on it all around Spain and convincing more people and talking with a friend and talking with their parents and talking about it and trying to spread it. When I, I, I did my job with my friends around before the May 15th and I could see it on the, on the Facebook page and they were good friends from like 15 years ago friends and they only two or three of them were in the Facebook group going to join the May 15th demonstration. After May 15th, Democracia Real Ya had probably about 80 of my friends. So there is a, a small group, there is a seed, and that seed is, is the idea, and then more people start gathering into the idea until it reaches the critical mass. But there is a critical mass. In Saudi Arabia, there was no critical mass at that point, and, and we as, as, as monkeys, monkeys how to, uh, know how to count. The fishes, when they are in the ocean, they, they know how to count. And when there are many fishes together, they, they feel nice. When there are too many fishes, they, they disperse. And when there are very few fishes, they go to a bank where there are more fishes. As human beings, we do the same. We need to have, create that critical mass. And that requires a lot of effort and an idea attractive enough that tells people, okay, I'm, I'm working on it. I, I want to do this. I, I want to be with you. And after that, there was this uh, redo of the demonstration because on the, for the May 15 demonstration, there was no media coverage whatsoever, nothing at all. So there was a redo, like a second chance. No? You failed the first exam, you didn't know when was the date, so here you have the opportunity. And there were more than, probably about a half a million people participated in uh, John 19th, and I hope you were part of them, or if not, you'll have more chances to participate. Good. So, you're all a lot welcome of, a to lot participate. Of work. There will be a lot of chances, I think, for all of us to keep uh, getting ourselves involved. And uh, apart from organizing, which was uh, an important uh, part of, uh, of the use of social media, uh, it's interesting also the, the way um, social media has served the purpose of registering a historic moments at a time where media, like uh, Omo was saying, were not there. Maybe they don't want it to be, but they didn't want to be there. Maybe they could not get there in time. In, in countries like Syria, uh, journalists don't get accreditations. So it's only citizens that can actually perform that role of uh, witnesses and of, uh, of uh, recording uh, these materials so that uh, they don't get lost. Like, I think it's interesting, like this picture, this screenshot that I took from a YouTube video shows uh, the, a funeral, people attending a funeral of, uh, of uh, demonstrators killed the day before. And uh, there, there are actually more hands, more mobiles than hands almost. So every citizen, not necessarily a journalist, not necessarily an activist, is holding a mobile phone and mobile phone penetration rate is very high in the Middle East and North Africa. So they know that they're witnessing something important and that they have a role to perform. So everybody of all ages, 
uh, has become a witness of, uh, of historic events. So this, is a, this video shows it pretty well. That there are so many hands uh, holding mobile phones. Let me see if this is... Maybe... You can go to the next one. Look at this, they're, they're chanting, um, we want you to leave uh, Bashar. So, um, now we have two at the same time. In all of these videos you see hands holding mobiles, like lanterns, like... Uh, like light bulbs. Yeah. So it's this was unthinkable only a few months ago to have this kind of chant in public, so that there are hundreds and thousands of people uh, chanting these things, recording it, registering, sharing it. The, the guy who sings this song, uh, after this video went worldwide, uh, just the day after he got killed by, by the security forces. So now we have this video everywhere, and we have uh, the message everywhere, but, uh, but people are under real threats and risks for getting involved in this kind of uh, visibility, public visibility. It's like uh, two, two sides of a coin. Visibility can protect you, but visibility can also expose you in a way that, uh, that puts you at uh, high risk. Right, Amira? It's very bad for my government. Should we share this video or should we move on? This is really yeah. emotional. Should we share this? No. no? It's pretty long. Okay. Yeah, I would like to also mention uh, one example of, um, of a very um, different kind of revolution which is, uh, also has a lot to do with the use of uh, technology and YouTube particularly, which is uh, women in Saudi Arabia. Women in Saudi Arabia cannot drive. It's the only country in the world where women are not allowed to drive. So uh, a, few, a few women have uh, challenged this, uh, this prohibition by, uh, by driving and recording themselves. Uh, and, uh, and publishing it uh, on YouTube. So it's, it's become uh, bigger and bigger, and, and uh, a lot of women were, were summoned on, was it on June 17? Yeah. To, to, to go and drive and take the streets uh, with their
Pakistan, it was used to mobilize people to protest and, and kick off the Egyptian revolution on January 25. And during the revolution, it had regular updates on what was happening on the ground. And until today, it's being updated regularly. Like this last entry here is about um, Mubarak and his trial, because now the Egyptians want their corrupt rulers to stand trial for, for killing protesters, for corruption, for stealing the country's wealth. Tell us a little bit about Nawat as well. Nawat is um, an, a Tunisian website. Um, during the Tunisian revolution, it was very difficult to get information from Tunisia, mostly because of the language barrier. Um, as Arabs, most of uh, many of us are, all of us speak Arabic. When we're bilingual, we speak Arabic and English. But in North Africa, North Africa has a special case the people there speak Arabic and in an accent we do not understand and they speak French, which is a language we, we don't understand. When it's written, it's easier for us because we can go to Google Translate and translate it, but when it's not written, when it's spoken, when it's in videos, it's very difficult to understand it. So we depended on French people to translate things for us, and they've been very helpful throughout the Tunisian revolution. And there was this website called Nawat, which broadcast all the information related to what was happening on the ground, and it translated it from French to English and Arabic, or from Arabic to English and French, and vice versa, giving us more of, of an understanding on what was happening on the ground. Also, with the Tunisian revolution, it was the first time we felt the power of the people on the street. And what we did was we all worked as amplifiers for them. So if somebody would tweet something, we would tweet it. If somebody shared something on Facebook, we would do the same. So everybody worked as a relaying post for the rest of the people. So when Tunisia happened, we were all Tunisians. When Egypt happened, we were all Egyptians. But then later on, everything happened at the same time. Bahrain happened on February 14. Yemen was happening before that. Libya happened on February 16. Then Morocco happened on February 20. And then Syria was on March 15. And then everything, hap everything started happening at the same time. So there was no, there, this mobility was not there. This organization was not there. It's interesting that sometimes it seems like uh, this uh, started uh, a few months ago, but there's a, there's a, a background to, to this, a background of citizens getting to know each other, um, establishing links, and, um, and organizing in a way that uh, made it easy. For, uh, for a global reaction to happen when the time came. I mean, it's not overnight that people started using these tools. They've been using them for a while. And actually, I think a good example of this is the, the Global Voices Project, where uh, Amira works and, and I also contribute, and uh, how you, um, yeah, you, you can publish a post there, and in a few hours, you can have it translated to a lot of different languages by people contributing from different countries. So, so there are actually links between citizens and between what citizens consider news versus what is news for traditional media, which is sometimes very, very different. So um, the, the Spanish mobilizations were very, drew, drew a lot of, uh, got a lot of attention. And I could see this uh, after I published this post on, on Global Voices. Yes, we camp mobilizations in the streets and, and, and in the, on the internet. It was translated to German, to French, to Malgasian? Ma Ma the language of Madagascar. Yeah, the language of Madagascar that I had never heard of and, and languages that I didn't even uh, had had any contact with. So, yeah, people in Madagascar were interested about what's ha what was happening in Spain, were translating this, and were making this kind of news available to other citizens that would not access this information through traditional channels. So, yeah, you can get an, an idea of uh, what this actually means. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the Spanish case, <coughs> um, I think citizens have... Uh, have uh, 
access what was happening through through this site and, and others? Maybe all can tell. That for me is the, the the image of success of a movement of people, and it's when the people that have been more involved launching a project, launching the idea, promoting it, making it, working on it, so there could be more and more and more and more people to join. Uh, they are super tired, as we were on May 15th, that we couldn't keep working. That was our objective, that was our demonstration. We should work on it, and we're doing weeks and weeks, working very hard on it. And then something from that movement, and from that critical mass, something else happens, and starts the campings in like, camps. This, this Yes, We Camp, and this Spanish Revolution, all around the squares. and. It wasn't made by people of Democracia Real ya because we didn't, no, no one planned it. We had the date, but no one planned the camps. There was another spontaneous movement from there that started spreading around and people that wanted to keep the revolution going. And it wasn't this part of the movement, it was another thing. And they created their own web page and they stole La Plaza and now they have. Uh, in, in many ways, I mean, they have, we have. I, I, I consider it the same, the same movement, the same idea. So uh, in Toma La Plaza, lots of hackers got together, lots of computer science people, lots of entrepreneurs. They started uh, creating their own applications, and that, uh, and that's the real success of a, of a revolution. Once you are super tired and you cannot keep working, then some other people appear and keep working on it and keep moving it forward and there will be more. And that's an example of creativity. Once you let the people do, do whatever you feel like. Do you like the idea? Do you think it's... Uh, what are the things that should be said? Get a pencil, get a paper and start writing. That, that, that's amazing full of creativity that cannot be directed. Cannot be, there cannot be a brain that tells them, hey, do that. And this is another thing about the social networks. I got just a little graph of uh, what are the, the evolutions of the Democracia Real ya visitors. And you can really predict the, 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 that there is something going on. Uh, that, that, it, that we are getting closer, that even if you don't read the news, if you are able to, to access the, this information, then you can see right there, a little bit before. Uh, the, 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 there was a peak. And in that peak, you could see that there was something, something going on. And after that, uh, the web page went, uh, went busted a couple of times when we reached more than 100,000 visits a day. And we had an average of 2,000 visits uh, about for two months every day. So that gives you the power to, to predict that there is something going on from inside the movement, but also from outside the movement, if, if politicians and people that, uh, that, that rule this world right now start getting a little bit smarter, the thing is that we are a little bit more advanced right now, but they will catch up soon. This is the way they have to, to predict if something is going on or not. If there's going to show up one guy or 10,000 guys or 100,000 guys. So those are the two sides of technology. Right now we are more advanced than big powers in the world, but we have to keep moving faster than they do. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the role of uh, media and how some, uh, some traditional media um, how, how new media are understanding better than, than traditional media the way these mobilizations are working and how they're allying with, uh, with citizens and, and um, with uh, the content citizens share online through Twitter, through Facebook, and how these are the media that are actually understanding the way uh, these mobilizations are working. But I don't, wanna, I don't want to take too long, and uh, I would like to leave uh, a few minutes for, uh, for whatever questions uh, you, you guys might have. And, and uh, I don't know, I would like to open these two questions uh, right now.
Well, I, I, I'm going to have to, well, it's not a, it's not a question. And I don't really like this format. I'm, I'm more used to the plazas, to the camps where we are all around and we talk and we share. This is like super far away. And us being here, it would look like important, but we are not. Like the importance is there, it's each one of you. But since we are here, it's, th there is something w we need, <laughs> w we all need to keep this moving forward. Uh, and you also need, and it's more, it's, we need a social Facebook. We, we need a social Twitter. We need more applications that are part of us that are not controlled by a huge corporation where Goldman Sachs might have a percentage and some other governments might have another percentages. And now that we are here at the campus party, if there is something that I would like to, to, to put in your mind is start working on them, forget about the business plan, forget about uh, who is going to finance that, think about social consciousness and how to put that social consciousness into the net and spread it better um, and, and, and work with us. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm from Colombia and my country. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a movement that it was called the Green Wave. The Green Wave. Green Wave, because it was with the Green Party. And it has a lot of movement in social media, in internet. But when was the time for crystallize it in, in, in social networks, but, but analog social networks, it became a mess and nothing happens. Uh, this one, this was one of the maybe biggest not working efforts of social media into coming like a change. Uh, they told a lot of things that uh, it starts a new movement, whatever, but it doesn't work. The, the, the real is doesn't work. What do you think is, is the click, the, the, the trigger, the join between analog social networks, real people in a square, real people voting, real people doing something, and just a movement of retweets, of reposts in internet. Vale, eh, a ver, eh, era un poco de información sobre lo que habéis dicho de que aún hay gente que se puede unir al movimiento 15M y es que el domingo 24 de julio eh, se congregan todas las marchas que han salido de diferentes acampadas y se va a hacer una manifestación global en, en Madrid, ¿vale? <ríe> y bueno, que el tema de redes sociales... Eh, se, se ha creado una red social para el movimiento que es N-1 que se está llevando en marcha y aunque va un poco lento está bastante bien eh, a solo informar sobre eso ¿vale? Yeah, what I understood from your question is that uh, what, what does it take to bring uh, people from online to offline, or from bring, uh, to, to bring this connection between uh, posting something and actually moving? What do you think triggers uh, this, Amira? Uh, in the Arab world, what triggered it is real life. Uh, in Tunisia, Ben Ali ruled for 23 years, and in those 23 years, life was becoming more and more difficult for Tunisians. Uh, the middle class was no longer a middle class. They were moving from middle class to, 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 
to to working class. Um, Muhammad Ba'azizi was a university graduate, and he had to sell fruit in a stall on the ro on the street, and 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 that was really frustrating. Jobs were becoming more scarce. People had to continue living with their parents because they couldn't actually find jobs and 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 work. But again, it wasn't a question of it wasn't a revolution of bread. It was a revolution of dignity because their voices were taken, their economy was taken, and their country was being run like Bin Ali's private real estate, where Bin Ali and his immediate family ran the state and 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 reaped all the rewards. So it was it the time was ripe. With Egypt, it's the same. They've had the same man running a republic. It's not a kingdom or a, you know, it's, it's a republic for 32 years. It's the same with Gaddafi, 42 years, one man, absolute power, a dictator. And it's the same with everybody else. Like, in this time, how many prime ministers have you had in Spain? In 40 years, how many, how many prime ministers did you see change? Presidents. Yeah. Presidents, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. So the time, the time was right, and, and it just happened, not because it just happened, but because people were fed up. People wanted their dignity. People wanted to feel their humanity. And we're talking about educated people. We're talking about people who went to universities, people who went to schools, people who've learned all about democracy in books. But in the real world, in the real life, it does not exist. They cannot even talk about it. There's a, another question um, there, I think, or? Yeah. Uh, but I'll follow a little bit with that. Uh, it, the time has to be, it has to be right. It, uh, it, there are lots of factors that have to, be, have to get together at a certain point and a certain time to make things happen. You cannot control them. The, the one who killed himself in Tunis, maybe if he killed himself three days before, maybe nothing would have happened. Or three days later. Could have been. And in, in Spain, and there is another thing, is the, the, the change. There has to be a change. You can live in a terrible, terrible situation during your whole life, but if there is no change there, I'd say that it's very hard to happen. Here in Spain, we are seeing how families are being taken out from their houses. They are 20% unemployment. There is a global debt that it's over, uh, well, a thousand, uh, a no, uh, 900,000 million, 900,000 million of uh, the, the debt the, that we have to, to foreign economies here in Spain, that we are going to suffer that. So there has to be a change. And once there is that change, you will have more probabilities for that seed to, to start growing. It'll be like a tree. Like puts lots of seeds, and some of them start growing into big trees, and some of them just disappear. And about the, the, the technology, the N-1 on the march, all those things, I, I don't want to talk about them. I want you to get interested on them, and, and join them, the ones you like, and change them, the one that you don't like, and get involved with more people and connect it with people. Revolution is about connecting people. It's not, I'm not talking about Nokia. I'm talking about real connecting people and connecting those ideas. That's, that's the essence of this revolution. Let's, uh, let's try to get a couple more questions. Maybe we can, uh, we can get to. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, Talking about uh, social media, um, social webs, websites like Facebook, Twitter, uh, and talking about uh, connecting people at the same time, uh, how do we know that the information that is in, in the top of the hashtags or in the top of, of the knowledge in the Internet is, is uh, ruled by pe actual people or, or by the the uh, marks the the governments or or the mercado 
It's yeah, a market. Think, yeah. In a market, yes. <laughs> so yeah. how, how do we know that Facebook, there is a company, Twitter, there is a company, and they mm -hmm. have their own um, interest, mm -hmm. aren't uh, involved in, in the information that we actually know, actually uh, um, browse and, 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 and follow in the internet. Yeah. That's an interesting point, actually, and we could have a whole panel or conference or, or summit dealing with the, with these issues because we are we're giving uh, information to we're sharing a lot of things and we're giving information to to private companies that are going to use uh, our data uh, for their own interest and I think we, we it's interesting that you're saying it we need to not forget that Facebook is not an NGO and that Facebook doesn't serve the people. Facebook is a, is, a, is business, and actually Facebook policies have been uh, very problematic for uh, activists in, in the Middle East and North Africa because they force you to share your real identity. Twitter, on the other hand, doesn't, and uh, it has taken some important uh, stance in, in favor of uh, demonstrators like uh, developing this uh, speak to tweet service that allows uh, people in a, in a, um, during internet shutdowns to send voice messages uh, by phone and it converts them into tweets. So that was very helpful for Egyptians, it's very helpful for Syrians now. So let's say that Twitter with Google took a stand with, uh, with demonstrators and freedom of speech. Facebook on the other hand hasn't. And actually it's, uh, it's pretty risky to use Facebook because it allows governments uh, not only to track your activity online with your real identity because you cannot, uh, you cannot use another name uh, and also it helps the government track your whole network uh, within, uh, within Facebook. So in an ideal world, we, will be, we would be using uh, our, own, uh, uh, me our own media, our own tools. But what happens is that everybody's on Facebook. So if you want to actually reach out to people, that's where people are, on Facebook. No? Mm, I'd like to add one thing, and that's a personal view. Uh, I'd say that uh, Twitter is here to stay, uh, Facebook is not. <laughs> Facebook will, will fail and, and there will be an open platform developed by human beings, oh, not by a company or shareholders, and we will be in that company. And Twitter is a lot closer than Facebook into that idea that we all need, and that's a human need. Question here, so and after that we have to finish. Okay, but I think that's going to be fine. Hello, I'm Pablo. Uh, just for complete that information, uh, it's great that you say that uh, we are in Facebook because everybody uh, are in Facebook. Uh, I want to I want to to appoint or give a solution for that lack of privacy. Is the open networks or, or distributed networks? We have one is diaspora, another identica, for example, and we have to. Uh, in the same time, we um, talk about liberty or, uh, or revolutions through these uh, social networks. We have to advise uh, also of this lack of privacy and motivate the people to use that uh, these uh, open networks, open social social networks like diaspora, for example. I also welcome you guys to, to talk to, to us now after the panel and uh, maybe we'll meet uh, during uh, the rest of the campus party and uh, just uh, it's good that you can talk to Amira, she's not uh, normally in Spain, so use this uh, to, to your uh, advantage and, and to get to, to know, let's get to know each other better and talk more. I'm really look, looking forward to that and uh, thank you for being here and let's, uh, let's meet later.